You are listening to Interesting Canadian Mormons, a podcast featuring conversations with interesting Latter-day Saints from across Canada. I am your host, Samson Nordquist. Today, my guest is Dr. Jason Sager, Professor of Medieval and Early Modern History at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. Discover with me what makes Dr. Sager such an interesting Canadian Mormon. Well, hello and welcome to our very first podcast of uh, Interesting Canadian Mormons. I am your host, Samson Nordquist, and I'm very, very delighted today to have uh, uh, my very first guest, uh, Dr. Jason Sager. Hello. Hello. How do you do? I'm very well. I'm, very, I'm actually very excited to be here as well. This is I'm, I'm looking forward well, to this. I appreciate. It. Thank you very much for agreeing to uh, to talk with me. And, You're welcome. Uh, I wanted to uh, oh, just introduce uh, um, Brother Jason Sager. You're a uh, uh, professor of me- medieval and early modern history at Wilfrid Laurier University. Yes. And uh, and so far, that's. On that's sort of all I know right, right now. I know there's I know there's a bunch more. I have known you for quite a while. Indeed, uh, it's been a long time actually. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Actually, a little secret here. Um, uh, I grew up in the same town as uh, as uh, Dr. Jason Sager and uh, uh, in, of Fort Erie, and yep. so I, I known you from from way back then. But uh, I've seen you do a whole bunch of things in your lifetime, <laughs> and they're probably too numerous for me to remember. But but we'll get to that. Um, uh, but I guess for starters, what exactly is um, medieval and modern and early modern history? What? Uh, well, medieval history um, is history. It's, it's a funny, you know, it's a, there's a lot to it. But briefly, um, looking at history, that sort of comes after the after the end of the Roman Empire in 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 in, the, uh, in Western Europe. Um, mm-hmm. And early modern Europe is usually seen as the years between about 1500 to 1800. Um, and so it, it covers a wide range of, uh, so a large chronological scale. Uh, so probably about, so basically so from, from the end of the Roman empire, approximately say about, so about 500 okay. AD, um, and sort of finishing up, uh, with the French revolution around 1789 to about 1800 is usually how we, it's about like 1200 years roughly or about, well, yeah, I guess so 12, like 1300 years. So it's a, so, so a lot, a lot of stuff happens. The millennium. <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed it is. Okay. Okay. And uh, and uh, you're, uh, how long have you been teaching? Uh, I've been teaching at Laurier uh, for about seven years now. I did my PhD at Laurier, and okay. I've been fortunate enough to sort of um, stay there at least for the last for, for while. So I've been teaching, yeah, about about seven eight years now at, at Laurier. So it's, always in the same in the same field in the same uh, uh, largely uh, European early modern. So yes, I, I've done. A little bit of teaching in global studies and a few other sort of outside, but no, but mostly within um, just the, within the history department, medieval and, and early modern. So, how does it how does it work? Are you uh, like if you you're a professor of history, um, and if they need you for something else, they can they can kind of pull on you uh, and and, uh, and it, it depends on my on the ex- area of expertise and what the and what the course requires. Um, for example, if they needed someone to say teach World War Two or something. Um, I most likely they wouldn't call you know, they wouldn't use me just because I'm not I don't have the expertise or the background um, in, okay. in World War II. Um, and so it, it does actually kind of depend on what the subject material is. Okay, um, for the global studies, for example, what uh, was the... I TA'd, and so really I was um, as long as I kept with, you know I kept up with the readings and, and was able to sort of keep up with things like that. But I wouldn't um, wouldn't be expected to teach a global studies course, for example, just because I don't have uh, the same background. Okay. Okay. And are you the the students that are in your in your courses? Are they um, uh, what are they stud- Where where are they going? Are they be, are they going to be historians or are they going um, to be? It, de- it depends like... largely. Particularly, I, I teach a lot of first year courses, um, and mm-hmm. so I get a wide range of students. A lot of students um, see uh, take the first year courses as an elective course, so they may be uh, in in the business department, or they might be in in sciences and in, in other fields, uh, and they're taking these first year courses as sort of their electives. Um, and so a lot of them are just doing it for uh, general interest. They're just generally interested in the subject material. Um, I find a lot of them yet haven't quite yet decided what they want to do with their with their lives. And so some do. I, I, I've known students I've seen um, that I taught in first year who've gone on to do graduate work um, in history or in other fields. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's quite rewarding to see that. But at first, most of them, no, most of them I really, I don't think I have an idea exactly what they 
are quite up to yet. So when they move on, do you, you kind of proud of them? To oh, I'm just, absolutely just proud of them. There, there, there are many of them that, I, that I'm actually quite proud of. Do you, do you, um, get, do you get to do some mentoring as well? Yeah, or? and that's yeah. one of the things I like about the job. Okay. Um, apart from the, the, you know, I find the subject really interesting, and so I really like it. Um, but I really find the mentoring part really rewarding. Seeing students who have, you know, sort of, sort of butt into, you know, their own scholars in their own right, and that's always that, that's always a fun thing to see. Okay. Okay. As uh, uh, those who know me, I, I'm, I'm into music. I, I never studied professionally. Like I never went to university, but, but I do teach uh, guitar. You know, beginner guitar lessons. And when you see when you see that student kind of, uh, kind of move on and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes. and do really well. Like I, I, I had this uh, uh, guitar student once where I, it was a very short time. You know, I, I taught her, oh, just a, just a few months, and then, uh, and they moved on to uh, like. They were performing like it was it was okay, quite right, yeah. gratifying to, to see that oh but, i'm sure you know, to, sure to sort of have a, a hand in that i it certainly you know she got there on her own merits and everything but just to sort of be a mentor for that time is kind of nice to see that do, do you do you find that those um that are interested in uh, uh becoming a historian i mean do you, do you kind of really take interest or do you do oh you, sure do, do you... i mean it's always fun to see people who are interested in what you do right yeah. um it's a little flattering, of course, but also, you know, because there's something I enjoy and I've found very rewarding. It's nice to see students um, who take that on as well. So, yes, uh, um, I've had students who I've helped mentor who aren't part of history and are interested in becoming historians. But um, mm -hmm. but it is really neat to see students who you can sort of follow more closely because they are sort of not necessarily following, you know, your particular form of history, but it's nice to see them um engage with it because I, I really enjoy it. So it's nice to see other people who also enjoy it as well. Is it, is it being a historian kind of like, uh, uh, I mean, there's certain rules or certain, I shouldn't, I don't know if that's the right word, but is it like, there's a, there's a certain, like there's a talent that you have to have. Or, I think so. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, the research and the teaching, um, like, I, like, like anything, whether you're a musician, same sort of thing, right? There are, um, I, I, I have no musical talent. I, I I've never, I played clarinet in grade nine, you know, for, you know, for, for that term. Um, but I imagine, it, you know, teaching is very much like a musician. It takes practice and it takes, you know, it, it takes some theory and it takes, you know, a lot of work to develop those, the, those skills. Um, and so in, in history or teaching the same sort of thing, um, in order to do the research and do history right, you know, you have to be able to uh, develop tool, you know, certain skills and tools in order to do that, it turns out be able to read documents and, and research and be able to analyze them and to sort of you know, sort of tweak out what what's being said, what, what people in the past have said or what they were doing. That's that's sort of what I had assumed. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I was so interested in having uh, you on the show is because you are a historian. Now it's in medieval and early modern history, but um, but having the having that tool set. Um, I, I'm interested in talking to you about uh, other things historical, sure. like like church history. And although it's not this the area of, that you had studied, I'm sure you're a much better historian <laughs> than I am in in that regard because you've you've had the training, you had the tools, you know how to really. I'm assuming that's how it is. Is it? Is it? Yeah, am absolutely. I assuming right? I think so. I mean, anyone can do it in that sense, right? I mean, it's one of the things I, I learned as I was doing my my PhD work um, was. I always had this idea that you know I looked at my my own professors. I looked at people who were doing PhD programs ahead of me, and I you know I always had this you know admiration for them because I always saw these people as really really smart, and, and they certainly were. Um, and when I became a PhD student and was going to my PhD, I, I realized well it's just me, and I didn't feel any smarter um, being in the program. I thought you know at times where I thought I was actually quite a fraud about it, and and I realized it, it dawned on me really what. A lot of these people, when you look at people with, with advanced degrees, whatever, um, yeah, they're certainly smart, they, but a lot of them are there, not because they're necessarily smarter than anyone else. It's just that they put a lot of time and effort and, and work into it. That's, it's in sense of an endurance test. Um, okay. And again, like, like a musician, you know, if I were to pick up, a, I'm sure I could learn guitar, but in the first couple of days, I wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be any good. But if I spent years at it, I, you know, we we can get better, um, and so history is is that same sort of thing, um, and so it's it's very useful to have those type of tools. Yeah, I use a similar analogy when teaching some of my students. I really I I, I teach them in a way where I, I kind of I give them everything I got. I say now you know everything I know over a fairly short period of time, over just a few months, 
And really, the only difference between me and you is that I've been doing it for 25 years, and you haven't, but you'll get there, and that's... That's that, exactly that's it. That, 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 that's exactly it, yeah. Okay, okay. And of course, I mean, that's sort of true. It's sort of, you know, you, as you go, you sort of discover things on your own and everything, but you're your own person. You're your own uh, artist right. at, at that point. In a way, yeah, certainly, certainly. Okay, okay. So, so doctors are not necessarily smarter. They just <laughs> put in the work. <laughs> that's exactly it, you know, in the way that um, you're, you are, I mean, I, and I've, you know, I've... I've you know, I know you're a very, very talented musician, um, but that's in part because you put in 25 years. Right, know, right. And, 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 I'm not any better, per se, than, than the next person. It's just I've, I've practiced a few more hours. That's, that's sort right. of how I look at it. So. And, and so that's exactly it. So the, so the point, so I think the thing, I, I, the way I take from that is, you know, other you know, church members or other people that um, are learning the gospel, and they're, they're, they're learning the church history, they're learning, the, you know, as we're going through in this year in the Sunday school with, with the Old Testament, um, is that anyone can have that type of knowledge. Mm-hmm. That it isn't, you know, it, I don't have a monopoly on on knowledge. I, I, I you know, if, if people see me as an expert or someone that knows of more than someone else, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm certainly flattered. But the, the, the brilliance of it, I think, is that anyone can have that knowledge. It, it, it's not, I don't own it. Um, anyone can. It's not just for smart people. It's, it's, no, absolutely, because just... everyone, because everyone's smart, and, that, and I think yeah. that's the thing I, I really take away from my experience as as a PhD student is that everyone's smart. You know, any, any, everyone can um, mm-hmm. can learn and, and to and can come you know, gain their own expertise in what it, whatever it is that they're that they're studying. Um, that it, you know, and that's me is the exciting part about learning is that I don't own. I don't need to be the only person that knows things and say it, that anyone, you know, anyone beside me, anyone on the street, anyone in the, in the class can learn it just as, just as easily or just as much as I, as I do. And there are many people um, I look at in our, in our own ward, but other people around that, that I look and I, and I admire what they know. And I, you know, I admire that they, that they know so much. And, and is it once again, going back to, it's not that they're smarter. They just have studied more hours is that sort of yeah, absolutely and, and and so i really appreciate it and, and yeah. that's why i like okay. it and i think it's it's good for me to it's a way of keeping me humble about okay. Okay. um realizing that if i know a few more things is because i've spent more time on it but it's not because i have a natural you know expertise that anyone in the class whether it's the science school teacher or a new a new convert to the church they all have the same skill set and they can they can learn as much mm-hmm. as much as anyone else. And I think that's exciting. One of the things I, I find really exciting about learning is that it's not only to a, a limited number of people. Anyone can have it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I totally, I totally agree with that. <laughs> well, one of the, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about specifically, and you, and you brought up, you know, gospel doctrine, we're learning, you know, the scriptures this year in particular, we're learning the old Testament. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to nail you with some questions, but okay. be, but before we do, I, I just want to get um, get to know you a little bit more. Sure. Right? Let our listeners get to know you, and and um, you know, uh, usually, I, I let's just start like right from childhood. Where where, where were you born? Did you um, grow up in the church? You know, I, I like, did. My parents. Tell me a little uh, bit my about parents are converts. Um, okay. My my both my parents joined the church um, when they were teenagers, respectively. Okay, um, and and they are they from the same area? Well, my Norfolk? dad is from the Niger, like Port Colburn, that area. His his mm-hmm. his family's been there for uh, generations. Uh, my mom is from England, um, and she mm-hmm. joined the church um, when she was fifteen or sixteen. Okay, um, and my dad joined the church about sixteen as well. So they didn't join together. Were they results of uh, like? Missionary efforts. They were absolutely were... results. Both both my mom and my dad were results of of missionary efforts. Um, both okay. are converts Excellent. through missionary work. Um, so yes, yeah, so 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 absolutely. Um, my dad actually met my mother on his mission, um, and I was born in the same area. I was born in, in Port Colborne, but lived pretty much all my life around Fort Erie in the Niagara the Niagara region. Okay, it's pretty okay. much where I spent most most of my life. Yeah, and I know that area well myself. <laughs> It's a nice, and it's a nice area, and I really enjoyed being there. It is, yeah. Yeah. Just, just look across the river, and there's another country, <laughs> <laughs> which always neat. Buffalo, Fort Erie, and Buffalo. Yeah. So, um, okay, and, and tell me a little bit about your upbringing in the church. Um, in many ways, I guess it, it sort of follows a, 
sort of a traditional trajectory. Um, my parents, like I said, were, were members when I was born, so I was born in the church. Mm -hmm. um, my parents really valued the church um, in their lives, and they valued it, valued it in, in our lives. Um, and so we grew up with um, both my parents who really you know, saw the importance of um, the church and in, in, in growing up. And so we were raised very much in a home that um, the gospel was, was, was formal, like sort of centered in, 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 in our lives. Um, and in a way, it was really, it was a really good upbringing. Um, my, my parents were both very active in the, and of course are still very, very active members. Um, they just got back uh, a year ago from a mission to St. Uh, to Johannesburg. That's you, right. That's right. Um, they, I, I, that's right. I heard, I heard about that. Actually, I spoke to them before oh, they had left. Right, yes. They, they were very excited. Oh, they were very excited. And so they're and back now. Yeah? They are, they are back. Yeah, okay. they, they loved it. And so, you know, my okay. so my parents have, have, a, have had a lifelong love uh, of the church and a lifelong love of, of the gospel. And that, they instill that um, in myself and, and in my siblings as well. And so, you know, we grew up in a home um, that was very much um, centered around, around the gospel, um, which I know... I know myself. I know, I know for myself. I, I, I certainly appreciate. That. I'm grateful for that. Um, and my, I have no doubt my siblings are uh, uh, as well. I, I was, um, and and I went to the same high school as you. Now you're a few years ahead of me. So I yes. I think I don't know. You might have graduated already by the time I got there. I might I, have. I'm, yeah, I, but it's been was, a while. Certainly, I was with with your with uh, one of your brothers and, and your sister. Actually, I was right. I was in high school at the same time as them, and and I remember like it was just. Uh, me and my siblings, and you and your siblings, and that was <laughs> almost it. There was another couple of families that that were yes. members, but it was for the most part, uh, there, yeah, there, very there few, were very few members in in the school. very small Mormon <laughs> presence in our, in our high school. How was that like for you? Um, it was all right. I, I mean, I, I certainly can't think of any horror stories. Um, I had good, I had a group, good group of friends. Yeah. Um, what did they think of you being a member of the church? Um, not much in particular. Again, you know, they they knew I was a member, um, but. Mm -hmm. it, but nothing in the sense that it's, you know, it ever affected um, anything. It never, you know, they knew and, and they had no problem with, you know, my standards. And um, and so it, it, the idea of, to me, being a, an only member in high school for a while um, wasn't, to me, it never seemed an issue. It, it, never, it never presented itself as, as an issue or something I felt um, that I had to defend myself or, or my beliefs. Um, it, it never was was a problem that way. Which I, again, knowing some stories and knowing some people who, and you know, hearing other stories, sometimes you, you you realize I was very fortunate in that regard that I never had. You know, I no one really cared, and that's like it, it didn't really it didn't really matter. Okay. I think which which was good. Just kind of come to think of it, um, I'm trying to think of others that are around your age, and I can't think of any that went went to that went to the same high school. No, no. You, I, you were the only one in the whole school? I, I was for a couple of years, yes. Wow. Um, yeah, at least when I went, there was maybe five or six others. Yeah, no, I was <laughs> Wow. I, I was the only one. So you were the lone, yeah. the lone member. <laughs> oh, was, was that lonely for you? In, in no, no, ways, no, no, no. It... Like I said, um, I had a good group of friends at high, sc in, in okay. high school. I developed a, 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 good, a good couple of friends. Um, and so I had friends out, you know, at high school. So, that, so high school itself wasn't lonely. Um, and I had some friends in the church for the youth program. Um, so they, but they were separate. You got, they were separate. You got your school friends and then your church friends. And, yeah, that's one yeah. of the that's one of the yeah. the quirks of having a ward where you live forty five minutes away from. That my my church friends lived in a completely different town, um, and, and so I had two sets of friends. I had my church friends. And I had my sort of non church friends. Um, yeah. And that was, so, that was sort of the common experience with, I, with a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think so. A lot absolutely. Of the same school, yeah. So, so yeah. high school was fine. So in that sense, high school, I had, I enjoyed high school. I mean, I was glad to get out and everything, of course. But I, I had, I have fond memories of high school. I, I, there, I don't, I certainly don't have any um, particularly bad. Like, actually, I actually a lot of fond memories. There, I, I had some really good times good. when I was in high school. So, did you do well in school? I did, or well yeah. enough. I, well enough, yeah. I enough to get me to university and sort of get me on sort of on the right path, I guess. Excellent, excellent. Um, your um, I remember growing up in the same in the same ward. Your father was my bishop for uh, quite a number yes. of years. And, yes. Uh, what was that like being? I, well, you know being what? Funny son enough, of I, a bishop. <laughs> I not. I don't. I don't. Can't really say. He was called as bishop uh, a few weeks before I left for my mission. Oh, really? Okay, so actually, funny enough, he got the call to be bishop the day I got my mission call. Wow! It was the same day. Wow! Um, and so I left my mission 
about two months after he was he was called as bishop, and then I came back after you know my mission in the Canada Montreal mission, um, and then spent some time at home, just sort of get, you know working against somebody together, and then and then I left for school. Um, okay, and so, so I did, you, not, you never experienced him as your bishop? Not that much. Not really. Just no, for a couple months. Eh? Really, just for a few months. And yeah. of course, by by that point, I was in my early twenties, and so my relationship with my dad um, was already pretty solid. And so yeah. I, I didn't have the same sort of pressure that some sometimes you see with with younger children. Um, I had my own life in a sense. So it, so when my dad was away on meetings and stuff, it really wasn't right. that big a deal because right. I was probably off working. You were or, like almost you were an adult. At, I was at, yeah. At oh, that I, point, anyways, absolutely. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so in that sense, I, I guess I again it it, it it was probably a different experience just because um, really far from a few months I I never really spent any time or really had to deal with my dad as as the bishop in the in the home and so when he would be off for meetings you know when you're 21 or 22 well you're off already as well and so was, yeah that same sort of time requirement that 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 you need isn't there and so. So it might have been different for some of your younger siblings. It might be, yeah. uh, absolutely, and um, you know, and I, they may have different things, but I, but I think overall for our family it was a really positive experience, um, you know, and, and you know, and I think so certainly, but but that was my experience of of being the son of a bishop, um, again, really in a sense, I didn't really notice just because I wasn't around as much. I was uh, yeah, it's university. probably not as I guess growing up as a youth and and for a youth. You know, the bishop is a big part of your life in oh, the church, sure. right? And, Absolutely. And that must have been a totally different thing. And uh, I guess, I don't know, you probably can't really speak to that because you were, yeah, because you were so old. But uh, but you were, uh, I mean, you are the oldest, right? You're the oldest. I am the oldest. You yeah. are the oldest. And of how many? How many uh, there are, I have three brothers and a sister. Okay. So what's that like growing up in a Mormon home? Uh, I was great. I, were, I, were I, good, I, good role model, good role model brother kind of I hope so. I, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I am sure. There are times I was not, um, <laughs> but no. It, it was. It was great. I. Yeah. I had a great childhood and I had a great home life. Um, you know, sometimes you 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 know you get the uh, the tell all books. There's, <laughs> I have no tell. There's no tell all book. Um, I, I had a. I had a really really good uh, childhood. Um, uh, yeah. I, and my you know my siblings that we 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 get along you know really well now. Um, you know, we were really, really close. They are scattered across the country, of course, with jobs and their own lives. Mm -hmm. But um, still very close. We it, it, we still I still have a very close relationship with with my family, and uh, it's something I really appreciate. And again, super grateful for, just because you know it's something that I you know certainly value. And that's uh, you, you attribute that to a big part of the, the gospel in the home. Oh, absolutely. Kind of I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I, I remember uh, well being in a border town. You know, we'd go to Buffalo. This is when yeah. the dollar was different, but <laughs> we'd go to Buffalo just to, to go shopping and buy gas and stuff. And then on the way back, uh, when you go through the, the, the customs, uh, we would always look for, where's Brother Sager? Where's uh, Bishop Sager? You know, because he was, that, sure. that was his, uh, that was his. Uh, that was, yeah, he worked at Canada Customs. Canada, yeah, Customs yeah. Officer. And so, yeah, he, but didn't matter. He knew. He knew us. <laughs> he would still have to ask the questions. You yes. Know, yeah. What's your citizenship? <laughs> Anything to declare? All those questions. And but uh, yeah, we always loved uh, getting him. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so, so you you mentioned again. You went to Montreal. Was that I, went to, you, <clears throat> I went to Montreal. That, that's yes. where you served your mission. That's where I served my mission. How was that? Loved it. Um, French French speaking. It was French speaking. Uh, although okay. I spent most of my time in English speaking areas. Uh, my first area was. Very French. I was in uh, a suburb of Trois Rivières, which is in between Montreal and Quebec City, um, and then I spent a, a year in Montreal, sometime in Ottawa, and then my last year was in Kingston. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I spent a lot. To, so that's not that far from. Where it you isn't. Live. <laughs> uh, well, I, I I looked on a map and at the when I was at, at the time, and I calculated I was closer to my parents' front door than I was to the mission home. In terms of geography, oh wow! <laughs> um, but no, I love my mission. It was it was. People talk about missions are, um, you know, each person loves their you know talks about their mission in in very fond ways, and, and I speak of mine the same way. Um, it was the right mission for me, and so you're. Did you speak French before going out, or was that uh, high school French and not very well? High school French, <laughs> which is probably in part why I ended up in English speaking areas. Oh, okay, um, okay. Which you know was a little disappointed, only in the sense that you know I like to. But on the same hand, it was also nice just because it was English speaking, and my, my French was really bad. Sort of now, in the areas that you were like 
I, I've been to Montreal as a tourist, and and I've been told that everybody speaks English. Is, a lot. Is, is, is that true? Or is, oh, is that like in, in, certainly the West End of the island where where I was um, situated. Uh, in the neighborhoods were NDG, Notre Dame de Grasse, and uh, Cote Verde too. Um, on the west side of the island, English, very much English. Um, of course, you run into French speaking, but largely the west end is predominantly an English speaking section of the city. The east end of the of, of the island is more French, but most likely they they do speak English, but will more likely they they tend to stay stay in French. Um, so you can be in, in Montreal for. A year, you can be there for years and still not have to speak French. It, it, it's sort of a, 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 it's a bit <laughs> odd. You know, we realize that yeah, the island, know, like, island isn't all that large. And yeah, there's some people that you know they say yeah, I'm from Montreal and oh, you speak French? Nah, no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and, 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 and if you're in the West, you don't really need to. It, yeah. it, it's it's a really fascinating thing. Um, but Montreal is a great city, and and I was really glad to be there for a year and and to to see it both. Um, Somewhat touristy, of course. As a missionary, you can't avoid some of the tourism aspects um, mm -hmm. just because it's you know, around you. But it was nice to get sort of into the city itself and, and see the people um, and, and sort of get a sense of the actual the actual life of the city. And I always appreciated that. How are the members in, in Montreal? Oh, they, now, this is, remember, this is interesting Canadian Mormons. They, oh, they're they great. might be listening. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, it's changed so much. I, I, I yeah. you know, it's been so long since I. I came back from my mission. It's been more than 20 years. And so I, I know the mission itself has changed and, and yeah. wards and everything have changed. Um, but at the time, the, the members were, I, you know, liked, I really liked the members. They were um, some fantastic, fantastic members um, in, in, in Quebec and in, in, North, in sort of eastern Ontario. Um, you know, they're, they're, they were some very kind, very generous members. Was there... Um... I can't remember. Is there a temple? Was there a temple? At there that was time? not a temple when I was there. No, the uh, the Montreal right. Temple came, came. Actually, I'm trying to remember the exact year, but no, it wasn't there when I was as a missionary. Right. right. It's there now, though. Right? It is there now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think they have one in. Don't they have one in Nova Scotia? I think so. Halifax. Not, they have a, I think Halifax. They, yeah, I think they, Halifax. Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So so it's nice to see that kind of growth. Um. When we again, as, uh, when I was in the Montreal mission, our growth was very slow. We, we, we didn't have a whole lot of baptisms, and the church wasn't particularly large. Um, mm -hmm. So to see a temple in in the Montreal the Montreal area is really encouraging, and you know, that's and that's, that's an exciting thing. Yeah, yeah. How did you find that your mission experience had had prepared you for the, the next things that you encountered in life? Like you came I, I I think so. Um, yeah. Not necessarily consciously, but I think you know. Some of the things that you learn on a mission, you know, some of the skills again, like discipline and the ability to, you know, the mm -hmm. um, to work and, and, and to those sorts of things. I think, of course, come in very came in very very handy when I went to school and, and things like that. Um, Did you go right to school? Right. When you I know. I, I took about a year off in order to work. This way, my mission. I came came off my mission in the summer, and so it was really a bit too late to register for for university. And in a way, I would I was glad to have sort of some time to sort of decompress mm -hmm. um, and relax and sort of get my head sort of straight again. Um, and in a way, kind of take a bit of a breather, work, get sort of myself acclimatized back to the sort of non-mission life. Um, and also put some money together for school, which, of course... That's a beautiful... Would, a year? <laughs> did you live, like, with your parents? I, live, I was able to live with my parents. Oh, um, beautiful. It yes, is, and so, yeah, it was, yeah. so I, was, I was able to save some money. Um, and then I went to the University of Guelph for my undergrad in the following oh, okay. summer. okay. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was, that was great. Did you know what you wanted to do at that time? I did. I did. I, for years, knew I wanted to be a historian. For years, I knew I wanted to be... Even before your mission, you knew this? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. That was... what, what made you... What drew you to uh, wanting to be a historian? Not everybody no. says, I want to be a historian. What, Funny enough, what Carl you... Sagan's Cosmos. That... <laughs> That 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 was the best. That was... It was... The, I saw that as a kid. <laughs> I saw that, you know... They... they uh, in history, in ancient history class, they they used to show those videos yep. as part of ancient history. And so I, wa I watched so wow. on PBS Carl Sagan's Cosmos, um, and I was so inspired by it. The idea and what what inspired me was Carl Sagan himself. That the idea of of it was it was so interesting to me. I I don't know. I must have been about eight or nine, I guess, when when it came out <laughs> or whatever. Um, and, and at first, I actually wanted to be I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to do what what he did. Not every eight nine year old wants to be uh, you know listens to Carl Sagan. That's, no, that's no, I, I was a bit odd. It explains why I probably didn't have a whole lot of friends at the time. But um, but no, I, that's, that's amazing though. Yeah, that's, so I it was just okay. 
and I turned out that I wasn't good in the math. And as it turned out, because I at the time, I actually thought that astronomy was simply looking at you know pretty pictures of galaxies and stars. I had you know, the, and my old eight you know my eight, eight year old mind. I didn't realize that you need very advanced, very very complicated mathematics, um, and I just didn't have the aptitude for that. Um, and Go so ahead. I still wanted to do what Carl Sagan did, uh, but I realized I had to do something that I thought I could do, and and so I moved into I moved into history. Which is sort of the same thing. Astronomy, that's sort no, of a history. No, absolutely. And, and I was, history, I think, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I think looking back at, you know, what drew me, it wasn't necessarily the, it certainly wasn't the math. And, and Carl Sagan had this way of, 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 you know, being able to talk about very complex and complicated ideas and theories in a way that, you know, I could, you know, someone like myself could understand and appreciate. Um, but I think what, what really drew me to to it was the history aspects, the how, how, the yeah, where these he, ideas came I, from. I remember some of those videos where he just to explain a principle. He'd, he'd have a whole segment on, you know, kind of going back in time and kind of yeah, explaining, and I think, explaining how a certain I, I can't remember specific, but right, uh, and, and yeah, I think yeah, that's that what kind of a, so in a way it was a natural, I guess, move into. I decided I can't do the math, so I can do, but I can do the history I, part. I wasn't just a great astronomer, but he was a great teacher. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Did, did that? Did, well, that's the ability to sort of tell a story really well and teach a very complex principle very oh, uh, uh, simply is absolutely. that sort of you wanted to that aspect of it as well you wanted I, to... I did I, again at the time I probably didn't I couldn't I probably wouldn't have been able to verbalize any of those ideas I, I can now but yeah I think that's definitely part of it was that it was really to me as a, as a child it was really interesting and even though I don't you know necessarily remember it I just remember that I was inspired by it I, I remember. I think the the thing that impresses me the most about Carl Sagan is is that uh, you know it makes you think. Yeah. You know, it's yes. not, not just okay. Here's a star, and this is how long it lives. All that stuff. He he would he would explain. Th it's almost a philosopher in, in a kind oh, of oh, absolutely, a, I kind of a way, right? Yeah. yeah. Now he's an atheist, and I. It's funny because some of the things he says makes you like as a, as a believing person, uh, someone who who does believe in God. I find that. The things he makes you think about actually makes you think God is even greater and even bigger yeah, than, than what you sure. previously thought. And and so actually that's one of the things that he says. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and uh, anyways, that's, uh, I, th I think that's kind of, that's kind of fascinating. So you knew since, since that age that you always wanted to be a historian. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, even so, even when you were on your mission, you were thinking, yes, when I get back, I'm going to, you know. I'm gonna go and, and go to school and all that stuff. Were you kind of consciously thinking that um, those kinds of plans? Not, on the missionary stuff, not so much because I was obviously trying to focus on on the missionary work. Um, but certainly, I I mean, in the back, I mean, I, you know, I mean, the point is, it, the ideas were of course still there. I couldn't, you know, you just can't just turn them all off. Um, but certainly, I, I knew that my post mission plans were going to include school, um, university, graduate work, and on and all of that. So yeah. Did you have to? Um... I, I'm I'm just noticing about you. Like I don't know. I I know you. I've known you for a long yeah. time. But there's certain aspects I don't know much about you. Like the whole history part. I, I've never had you as a, a history teacher, but I have had you as a gospel doctrine teacher. I've had you know in different capacities in some of your callings. Uh, you you were in the Sunday school presidency, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, and so you're, you know, not just historian. You're you're a teacher. You're a very good teacher. Too. Oh, thank you. D did you have to take any special courses for teaching? Or no, that... at, at what, what, what to teach at a university, you just have to have a PhD. That's really the only qualification. Now, a lot of programs. It doesn't matter if you can teach or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, in a sense, um, I mean, now granted, they do give you opportunities to teach to get practice, but no, there's no equivalent of a teacher's college. Right. We're, in public school, high school, you have to. I'd have to. You have to go to a teacher's even, college. Even even with it, even. At my level, um, with, with the PhD in, in my years of experience, if I wanted to say find work in high school or, or grade school, um, I still have to go to teachers' college to get that certificate. Mm -hmm. um, but no, to teach at a university, there there's no special, there's no equivalent of, of a teachers' college. I mean, we can certainly there's plenty of opportunities. I wonder why. What why is that? Is there, well, is, the, is... no. The thing is, is the whole purpose of university is research. Okay. Um, and, and so the idea is that one does research, but one also teaches. Um, so the, the, the focus really is, is on the research and, and teaching is, is one of those sort of, for some people, a secondary thing. Um, so you're not, is it sort of, you're primarily there as a, as more of a mentor? Um, 
the reality that's that's some of the sort of the the, the ideal the, the reality of course is that we all teach and, and the fact is that um we do a lot of teaching yeah um along with our with our research so mentoring it, it, again it depends on the it depends on on the professor some yeah. professors and certainly my colleagues um are fantastic mentors uh, we uh, you know the history department at, at laurier has some really really fantastic fantastic mentors um, and, and Laurie students are, are very fortunate um, that they have such high quality uh, faculty in, in the department. Um, but but no, the fact is is that a lot of us we we have to learn it ourselves. Um, now, granted, there's plenty of opportunity resources, you know, teaching courses. There's yeah. um, all these sorts of things that are available to us. But but no, there's no. I don't have a specific certificate that says I can teach. So how, well, how did you get so good at teaching? <laughs> is it was it just practice. one of those things? I same it, it, <laughs> it, it really comes down to that same that same basic idea you there are very few geniuses in the world and there are very few people there are very few prodigies in the world mm -hmm. um most people just about everyone who's good at something have gotten there because they practiced because you've done um, it for so long and yeah i you know, i think of the old the old adage how do you get how do you get to carnegie hall <laughs> practice 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 yeah yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, I, I like to think that I had some natural sort of talent to begin with. Um, but the fact is, I, not enough to rely on. And so it, it's a question of practicing. Just... Uh, again, people feedback, uh, students who tell you what they liked about the course, what they may have not liked, um, mm -hmm. and, and taking those things into consideration. Um, and consciously so, working. And consciously it. working to okay. to find out where... What can I what 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 can I what can I improve? Okay, T tell me about some of the uh, the callings that you've held in the church. Uh, mostly teaching. Um, I spent a lot of time in, in the Sunday school um, when I did my I did my masters at BYU, so I was in Sunday school presidency there, which was a lot of fun. Um, having I, I had great teachers. I, I never taught. I taught a few times when I had to sort of fill in, um, but I had we were able to drop. Uh, an amazing quality of people to, to teach some fantastic Sunday school. Um, I spent a lot of time as executive secretary um, as well, working with, with various bishoprics, which has always also been really rewarding for mm -hmm. me. Um, but I, I, and I've always enjoyed those callings, but I've always enjoyed the teaching ones uh, as well. Uh, currently I'm in, I'm in the primary. Um, yeah. Yeah. Teaching. It's, so. it's sort of, yeah. Full circle. I, um, you've, you've, You've taught just about every every just about, group in the seems, church. It eh? seems that yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I I know. Uh, I think when I was, where was I? I was in the. I think I was in the youth, or I forget. I forget what calling I was in currently at the time. But for six weeks, they had me go take this uh, teacher improvement course, and you were my teacher. <laughs> and I found that course to be extremely helpful. Oh, good. And uh, I found you to be very helpful. Oh, thank as, you. As a teacher, and so. Uh, uh, I, I guess I don't know if it's. I mean, you are a professional teacher, and uh, and and you really were teaching the teachers how to teach, and that was very very helpful. What would what would you say to gospel doctrine teachers, primary teachers, uh, youth teachers uh, about teaching in the church today, especially with the the curriculum the curriculum that we have today? I I think it it, it takes a there's a number of, I mean, and teaching the, in, in, in the church is, is different than teaching at a university. There, there are certain diff, obviously diff, obvious differences. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some of the common things, apart from the obvious, you no know, teaching with the spirit and, 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 and you know, so those sorts of things, um, given the, the way the curriculum is set up, um, I think there's a real responsibility for, for, for teachers um, not simply to slough off what they're doing, you know, cause come in and, and just to simply go for 40 minutes and, but to actually really prepare. Um, and, and now with, you know, with the internet, um, and, and the technology, the technology and the resources we have, we, ha we have so much more at our fingertips that than we did even 10 years ago, or even five years ago as to what we can access in terms of developing really, really strong lessons. Um, and so I think, one of the things I would, I would say to anyone if they were to ask my advice would be um, spend some time on it. Um, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the manuals, the lessons really are only a guideline. They, they're, they're a real sort of, you know, just a, they're, they're bare bones. And it should allow people um, to really develop it in their own, their own voice and, and develop the, the material. Yeah. 
um, was it last year or the year before where they came out with the new youth curriculum, Come Follow Me? Um, yes, yeah. Uh, what did you think of that when it came out? Uh, I think, again, I, I think it, it's a really neat sort of thing. I, I, I know um, sometimes we you know, sort of question the, the, when we look at it and realize the, you know, sort of the correlation of, of church teachings and, and um, that seems to, you know, be sort of shrinking the, the manuals, right, to a point where they're now half a page. But I think at the same time, it's a really exciting opportunity that teachers, um, if they have the, you know, can have this opportunity to really develop their own lessons, you know, that, you know, and, and to bring in their own insights and their own experiences. And I think, um, again, with, you know, LDS.org and, and, and the resources that, that it provides, but I think that other resources as well that may not necessarily be seen as, um, you know, necessarily LDS or, but the fact that there's a now, a, you know, a, a wide a wide range of LDS scholars who are doing some really fantastic work um, mm -hmm. that, you know, in terms of our, our church history and our church church doctrine and our understanding of, of the scriptures um, that we have access to now. And, and I think that type of stuff is, is really valuable in terms of, of teaching. And I think the new curriculum uh, really can allow for a lot of latitude that way. Okay, so uh, I guess in the in the old system... And I remember being a youth and having teachers that just sort of sat there, opened up the manual and kind of word for word read, yeah. just right out of the manual and, and be completely nervous. And at the time, we just, the, the, the youth just kind of sat there and yawned and didn't really, <laughs> yeah. at least we weren't that disruptive, but uh, some classes I'm sure were, were, I'm, were I'm very I'm sure, disruptive. I'm sure. But uh, not, not wanting to criticize that teacher uh, too much, but it didn't look like they, they had prepared a whole lot and, and in in some ways the manual is great because uh like I'm, I'm talking about the old manual because you can kind of go through a lesson without any preparation and just sure. word for word go and, and ask the questions if that teacher doesn't prepare this time and they only have this much uh uh on the page you know half a page worth of stuff can they still can they still do the same uh, thing no or, I, I, or... I i don't think so and, and i think um and i think that's the way it should be uh, honestly i i think um one of the things it kind of forces you to have to prepare, oh it, right? it really does because you yeah. can't I mean you can read half a page and you know five minutes and you're done and then you're you're sort of stuck now what do we talk about right right and, and I think so I I think that's great um and again I know that correlation you know ha has come under some some criticism and I think not completely mm -hmm. unfair at times I um and is this is this a direct response to that criticism? People? Well, I I think what it is, um, and so the way I look at it, and it's just just my opinion, and it's sort of the way I look at it, is mm -hmm. that what these curriculums allow is greater independence, or can allow for greater independence. That you get someone, um, hopefully, who is confident enough to to take a, a lesson, say for example, on mm -hmm. uh, you know the youth curriculum, which is mostly based on on principles as opposed to necessarily you know specific you know, scriptures or anything, but they actually focus on things like charity mm -hmm. or they focus on faith and, and faith in Jesus Christ. Um, kind of and, foundational stuff. Foundational right? stuff, which, you know, it, it's really important, uh, particularly in, in, for, for the young men and young women, um, but that a, a, a teacher can go through and, and not only look up the scriptures and look up sort of the suggested, you know, sort of excerpts from, from conference talks, which are, again, really important, um, but that can develop their lesson in a personalized way that hopefully can avoid, you know, some of the lessons that we sat through, and myself as well sat through, where the teacher, again, not to, not to not to pick at the teacher, but where lessons didn't didn't seem feel all that relevant or, or mm -hmm. weren't interesting because you know I, the stories weren't really. They, whereas you can still go into class now and say, here's some really interesting things I found, and let's talk about what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and what what, is, what does charity really mean and, now, and these I, sorts of things. I've been on, I guess, both sides of that. I've been the student. I've been the teacher. And, uh, uh, you know, it was very, very clear. You stick to the manual. Don't bring in other materials. That's a big no-no, right? And and in some ways, to, in the past, the teacher may have felt handcuffed. They, they, they're, they yeah, feel and, like they're not allowed to, to do anything except and, read from the manual. And, I was, <laughs> and, I, and, and for, for a while, I was in the state science school presidency, and that was one of the things that when we go towards, we would we would emphasize or we would reiterate that don't stray from the manual. Um, so what, again, and what was the what was the? Well, the I think the idea, you want to make sure you didn't bring in false doctrine. You want to bring in ideas that weren't accurate. Um, and that's the whole idea behind correlation. The idea behind correlation is, is to ensure that you have a standardized 
right. you know, sort of systematic. So the point is that if you went, no matter what church you went to, what, what ward or congregation you went to, you knew you, one, you knew what lesson you were going to get approximately given, you know, state conference here or there, but, yeah. but yeah. within, within reason, but also to ensure that the doctrine was standardized so that, you know, there weren't some ward off in the wilds of wherever teaching, <laughs> you know, stuff that was completely their own doctrine, their own, <laughs> quite literally their own doctrine. Right. But I think though now, given that, um, given the the resources that we have, given the access of the internet, um, the the church, for example, has been publishing online the Joseph Smith Papers, um, which I think it, 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 certainly a lot of LDS scholars have been salivating for and, and appreciative of it, mm-hmm. um, which aren't necessarily in the official curriculum. You know, you know, in the manual, but certainly, if you know, if I was doing it, if I was doing, a, say, a, a lesson on church history, or if I was doing the Doctrine and Covenants, that to me would be a primary. So, I'd be one of the first things I'd want to it's an official access now. That, I, I, I would certainly consider it as such, even though it's not necessarily in the manual. And, and so, I think we're at a point um, in terms of what's out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, also what scholars have done, uh, people like. Um, uh, Richard Bushman, who who did you know a few years ago uh, a biography on, on Joseph Smith, um, Turner, who's just finished mm-hmm. a biography on Brigham Young, um, I, I have scholars who are doing these type of this type of work um, that aren't necessarily faith building, but neither are they. They're not condemnation of the church. They're they're good scholars. Those are the, yeah, those are the scholars, and I, I think uh, admittedly they're they're biased, or they're not they're not biased, but they are biased in the sense that they're believing Latter Day Saints and. Um, but believing Latter Day Saints and those critical of the church love them equally, right? Because something like say Bushman or or or, or Turner, who is biography just finished uh, on Brigham Young, um, their work is really important mm-hmm. because the thing is, if we want to know our history, and again, think of, of the history of the church. If as members, we should really be aware. We you know we should know our church history and know that it isn't always rosy. That you know that there are that there are episodes in our in our past that um where we're quite different or, or or may seem to be you know really interesting just because um they 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 go against sometimes some of the more sanitized mm-hmm. accounts but I guess my point is, is that in a Sunday school class or in young men's or young women's um the fact is that these resources now exist, and so to me, going outside the manual no longer seems isn't the same worry because there's an awful lot of outside the manual stuff that would fit really well. That's, you know, um, that isn't, ant- that isn't about, you know, knocking the doctrine or, or, or necessarily, you know, that like, jo- I, again, I think of the Joseph Smith paper project that the church is, uh, has, um, has initiated. Uh, and again, if, if, if anyone teaching doctrine and covenants, that to me would be one of the first things I'd want to ensure I brought into, into the class mm-hmm. because, here we have the documents. I mean, it's great. We have the Doctrine and Covenants. We have all this. But here's Joseph's so, actual writings and his actual words, and, and we can bring that in. And those resources were just simply not available. Or, were, or if they were, they were in books uh, not friendly <laughs> to the church, Or, or, right? or, or <laughs> just not as, as accessible, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, like the Joseph, Smith, Joseph, uh, the Joseph Smith Papers would have been in archives, um, mm-hmm. and not every, you know, the general membership aren't going to go to Salt Lake to get into the archives to do the Sunday school lesson. Yeah. Um, but now that they're online, and again, this is I, again why I go to the idea that um, you know the the web, you know the internet, um, this technology has been a fantastic is a fantastic tool in, in, in gospel teaching because it allows hopefully teachers to to access quite easily from their own homes now material that had been you know very difficult to access just for just for practical reasons you know that most of the stuff is in the church archives. Um, and those of us living here in you know, Ontario aren't going to make the trek simply to, yeah. to do that. <laughs>